Hey, Billy, thanks so much for being on the show. If you could, please introduce yourself to our audience and provide some context as to how you got into real estate. Yeah, sure, Corwin. I'll definitely do that. But you know, one of the things, if you don't mind, I just really quickly, I would like to ask of your audience, because I know that you do this with a lot of love and you do this with a lot of uh, passion to continue to educate. And, and for everybody, if you have not had a chance to already, if you could just leave an honest written review as well as a rating, I know that continues to help bring other guests that are going to add you more value. And uh, I think that is one of the things if that would definitely add a lot of value to you as a listener and as a viewer. Um, and, and with that, just kind of as a background, Kerwin, I'm, I'm a guy who today is had a lot of life experience, but originally from uh, Columbus, Ohio, very working class family. Both of my parents worked two jobs. Um, I watched my parents struggle a lot when I was growing up. They had to make really difficult decisions by the end of the month, like did they pay bill A or, or bill B? Uh, so I know what it's like to grow up in a family, well, where finances are not something that, n number one, you don't talk about, and number two, when you do talk about it, it's usually something that's not very good. Um, by the time I was 12, like I was born in Ohio, but we'd moved to Colorado, we moved to Texas. My brother and sister were born in Colorado. Uh, I'd probably lived, just to give you an idea, in like probably eight or nine different houses. And also to that, I think a lot of that had to do with basically the, the at the end of the lease, we kind of had to find a new place to go. Um, my parents had some marital problems, uh, eventually divorced. And my dad moved to the East Coast. My mom uh, stayed in Ohio. One of the things that happened with my parents, because they didn't have a quote unquote formal education, they really put a lot of emphasis for me and my brother and sister to get out and, and get our degrees. And so um, I am someone who was a very good student. I consider myself an A student uh, in, in high school, in college, uh, and I always did what I was told. And because you did what you were supposed to do, you studied, you got a good grade on the test, and I continued to do that for most of my life. Today, I consider myself someone who's a recovering perfectionist. Uh, because, well, you know, when you go from theory to, to practice, you realize that things don't actually work exactly the same. Uh, even when one of the biggest rejections in my life, I right out of college, I had I have two degrees, but uh, I had a dream job that I wanted to work. And I was rejected by my dream company twice out of college. And I didn't really know how to handle that. But one of the things it did, Kerwin, is it opened my world to something completely different. Um, told you about the background where I come from, and I had my eyes set on this really important job at Procter & Gamble and got rejected once, twice. But I started working right after college once I got rejected twice and two degrees uh, for a company that actually sent me around the world, and I was working and traveling throughout some 58 different countries. It was absolutely amazing, and so I didn't see myself going to a normal nine-to-five job. And I ended up moving uh, because I wanted to take a one year sabbatical. I moved to Paris, France. I was accepted at a university there. So I got a chance to continue my education, which was really cool. Uh, I wanted to learn how to salsa dance and I wanted to learn more about wine. And I was supposed to go back to the US one year later, but as luck would have it, uh, I have since stayed in Europe. Um, I got into the IT industry. Uh, I went from Paris down to a town in Montpellier. I ended up meeting a really cool, uh, cute Spanish woman. Uh, right before I was sent to Italy, I started a sales team there. I was still in the IT space. Ended up going back to France. The, the young lady that I met, she and I continued to stay in touch. We had a long distance relationship. And eventually I moved to Spain. And a couple years later, we got married. A couple years after that, uh, our first son was born. Our second son was born about a year and a half later. And so um, I always kind of joke with people, Kerwin. I tell, tell them, you know, no matter where you come from, uh, no matter what you've done, be really, really careful. Because if you ever have the chance to take a one-year sabbatical, it can turn into 21 years, three countries, learning four additional languages, a marriage, and two children. So um, that's a little bit about my story. I, yeah. Up until recently, I was working in the multinational. I did that for 26 years. And uh, today I still call Spain my home, uh, where I live. I live here in Barcelona, Spain. And, um, and yeah, I've just, I've been very fortunate, seen a lot and come from very, very humble, uh, humble background. That's awesome and very inspirational. There's a lot I want to dig into there. Starting out, I, I can relate to you in that way where I was also very academically focused. Um, I was prioritizing my, my school and my grades. I think it was this, this, I don't necessarily to misbelief, but there's this narrative that if you do well in school, that that correlates to success and that will guarantee success. And so that's what I thought. I remember um, sitting in my, my junior year of high school classes or sociology class, uh, ironically, but we were learning, I was looking up jobs that would make the most money. And I didn't even think of the context in the context of uh, what business would make me the most money because no one had ever taught me that somebody like me could start a business or be in real estate and invest in real estate. And so I always, always thought in the context and paradigm of a job. Um, and, and I also you touched on the the role saving and how you probably didn't even think about investing. I've heard you talk about how that was kind of like your version of investing was saving your money. And that, that's kind of is a 
a reflection of the, your background and your kind of your, your, the environment you were growing up in. So can you just touch on saving and how that, why that's not necessarily the best way to create wealth? <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's, it's really challenging, Kerwin. I mean, you hit on something that is really important because the way that I grew up, when I watched my parents struggle and, and even family members and, and most of the people that I was surrounded with, if you had money at the end of the month, like that was a big deal. That was considered investing because you made it to the end of the month with extra money in your pocket. And so I grew up thinking that Number one, we didn't really talk about investing, but my assumption was that was investing because you made it to the end of the month and you had extra money. And so when I went away and I was in college or and then I finished college because I worked through college, I had like sixty thousand dollars worth of debt. And this was back in the this is back in the mid 90s. Right. So there was a lot of debt that I had for my five years of college. Um, and so I knew what that responsibility was like. But as soon as I got out, I had a chance to start working in that job where I was traveling five years, 58 countries. And I started having money left over. And so then I learned the difference between saving money and investing money because I had that conversation with the HR person. And then I started putting my money in my 401k and my IRA. And then I realized the difference between savings and investing. And the thing of it was, is the savings made me feel really, really good because I didn't come from a background where we, they saved money. And so I started feeling really, really good. But what happened was I, when I was investing, the investing, I had no control. So the top comp bubble happened in 2000 and I lost my, the things that I was investing and I was freaking out because I had no control over that. And then when I started investing and then they told me, Hey, there's this thing called DCA, DCA. And, and when I said DCA, well, what is that? And it's dollar cost averaging, right? It's kind of like you put the same amount of money every two weeks and eventually it would come back. And then the same thing happened to me again in 2008 where I lost 33% of the value of my portfolio. And so that for me was realizing the difference between savings and investing. And then one, I had a little bit of control over almost none when I was investing because I was investing in the stock market in a secondary market. And I later understood what that meant and then saving. But even though I was keeping money in the bank, I was saving what I didn't realize, Kerwin. And this is one of the things that I know you really focus a lot on helping to educate your audiences even though I was saving, I was just keeping there, keeping money there because it made me feel good because I didn't grow up that way. But what I didn't realize was that the money was slowly eroding in front of my eyes because the, the amount of money that they were actually giving me to keep my money in the bank was below what the inflation was. And it's continued to be below what inflation is. And so as you continue to realize that keeping money in the bank is probably very similar for the way that I grew up, because a lot of people still continue to do that. But it's not the most efficient way for you to continue to grow your money and provide freedom uh, of financial freedom or freedom to do the things that you want to do when you want to do it. So hopefully that answers yeah. uh, your question. No, it absolutely did. And you, you mentioned the impact uh, of the crashes that you were you lived through essentially um, that that had on your portfolio. I would love it if you could, because I've heard you refer to stock investing, at least in your case, uh, sort of gambling, like gambling. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain how that was different from how you were approaching investing just just in, in real estate? Yeah, sure. So when you so when you have this opportunity to place your money somewhere, but you don't really know what the outcome is. That's to me, it's like when I go to Las Vegas, like I went, I, when I was in the States, I would go to Las Vegas with friends of mine and you, you go there and you're on the table, your black tech table, and you don't know what the next card is going to be. You have probabilities, but that's because people that are there and counting every single day mm -hmm. watching the table. But if you're working a job and you're really busy and you have all of these other things, because that's, you know, I work really hard and I've continued to work really hard. That's what I saw my parents do. I didn't have time to pay attention to what was happening in the market, probably like, and I'm going to make an assumption here, like 80% of the people that are invested in the stock market, whether it's through 401k and IRA. So because I wasn't paying attention to it, I didn't actually really understand what was happening. So it was just the exact same thing. Putting my money in that DCA, that dollar cost averaging every couple of weeks was just like flying to Vegas and putting a couple of hundred bucks or five bucks or 10 bucks or whatever you feel comfortable with betting on the blackjack table. There was no mm -hmm. difference because I wasn't aware of the outcome. The difference came, and, and one of the things that happened to me was, and I, I've, been sh I've, I've shared this story because I used to be really, really ashamed of it. Um, and you know, if I could go back and tell my younger self uh, something, one of the things that I recognized was when I was traveling in this corporate game and really looking to move up the ladder, I was missing out on a lot of time with, with, my, with my family. I had young children, and eventually 
you know, my, uh, my third, my oldest son on his third birthday, I was actually traveling to Frankfurt from Barcelona and I missed his third birthday. It's one of those things that it's, I can never get it back. Um, but what it did is it took a lot of the theoretical things that I had read in like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, a lot of the podcasts I was listening to and videos, and it forced me to move from theory to action. Mm -hmm. And so when I moved to action, one of the things that I really enjoyed about real estate and what I understood about it, and to, to answer your question to, at, at this point, is really looking at real estate was something that was a matter of saying, okay, there's revenue, which comes from the rent initially, and if, you know, depending on what type of asset you ride, but let's keep it very simple to like a, a single family house. You're bringing your money in and the rent is paid, that's the revenue. And then you had another line below that, which is, or a number of lines, which are th the operating expenses. So there were things that you had to pay, like your insurance, like your taxes, your maintenance and repairs, um, a lot of different service fees, things like that. But it was the revenue minus those operating expenses gave you the net operating income and then if you had a mortgage then you paid the mortgage and everything after that was like cash after debt service which was the money that you got to keep in your pocket so from a model perspective it was really simple and most importantly i could control that because i based on what the market that or the location i was living in i knew what the rents would be if i could make sure that the, the expenses the operating expenses were controlled then i pretty much knew what my net operating income was going to be on that single family house and then from there I paid my mortgage so to me the speculation it was one thing I had no control but then when I started looking at an asset like a like a single family house it was something that I understood the model made sense and I was in much more in control of it which is what gave me the sense and the feeling of hey listen I want to continue to do this because I can control it mm -hmm. Hopefully I that makes sense. Absolutely, it does. And I agree. I mean, we have invested in crypto in the past and did not go well because in a way that it was gambling, we didn't understand it. And that's why, you know, real estate is our bread and butter and we focus on it and we've taken the time to really educate ourselves in it. And so, I mean, I, I just completely agree with what you said. And I know at the beginning of your real estate journey, you started out by investing in Barcelona or at least attempting to. Um, I would love to know, just just because I'm curious, honestly, why, didn't that, why did it not work out in that area? And then how did you kind of... Um, what did you do after that? Yeah, love love your research, man. And you're making me think of when you and your brothers were on uh, the Going Long podcast in episode 161. I was like, man, you're doing your research. I love that, <laughs> man. I love that. So, and to your point, so when I read the books, the thing that I was understanding, Kerwin, is I understood the model. So it all started making sense to me, but I was not sophisticated enough to understand the difference between the types of locations. What do I mean by that? Well, I read the books, and when I read through the books, all of the books made me feel like Hey, by the end of the by the end of this, you should have like two hundred dollars a door, three hundred dollars a door. It's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. You can control it, right? And so when I started applying that same logic to where I lived here in Barcelona, went out and started looking at the models and understanding the differences between one country to another and uh, one city to the other. And I and things kept penciling out when I was underwriting them, meaning that I was looking at the revenue minus the expenses minus mm -hmm. the um, debt service. And things kept coming out negative. It was like negative 50 euros, negative 100 euros, negative 75 euros. And I couldn't understand it because I was like, hang on a second. These, these, but these are supposed to be two or $300 a door. Well, it was because I was in a location that is not based on cash flow. It is one that is very much appreciation based. And so when you look at purchasing the value of the property, or you look at purchasing the, the property and the value is created through appreciation and times. And so the fact that I couldn't get cash flow and I knew that I wanted to get cash flow, and I have a couple friends here in Spain that I really, really appreciate, and they were like, Man, you're American. Why don't you buy back in the United States? And so that once I got over the fact that like it was eight thousand kilometers or whatever, six six thousand five hundred miles away from the closest coast, that's when I started taking action to invest long distance from Barcelona back to the US because that's what being in those those locations were what gave me the probability of getting cash flow, which is what I was really looking for. So I did try at Barcelona, didn't work, didn't pencil out. I also didn't have enough education and I didn't have enough network either because there are people that are here that make cash flow. But mm -hmm. now that I've built my systems to, to work back in the US, then that's what we'll continue to do.
That's awesome. It's very inspirational to see you starting out. I mean, you said, like you said, you didn't really have much education, but you were able to break into the U.S. market um, and, and from another country. And so I think yeah. that's kind of a testament that it's possible for hard, you know, anyone, especially if you're here and you can invest in your backyard or in a market that you can drive to like we do. Um, so I would love to know what were some of the first steps you took when you wanted to first break into the U.S. real estate market? And what are some uh, insights or takeaways that somebody can learn from the steps you take or maybe you took or maybe the mistakes you made? Yeah, sure. Well, I made a lot of mistakes and I don't think you have enough time for me to, t- <laughs> to, talk, to talk about all the mistakes I made. But, but what I would say is when, like, I love when people have these really master plans and they've kind of thrown all this stuff together and it's, you know, they've thought about it and they executed these master plans. If I just have to tell you what happened to me, Kerwin, I got to a point where I was so frustrated with the stock market and I needed control, right? I told you about it before. And so what I knew is I had money in the bank, right? Because for me, that that gave me a feeling of safety, of security. Uh, and so I probably kept more money in the bank than I needed to. And what that meant was when it was time to take action, like the only thing I thought about is I have this money to put into the down payment for a property. And so I didn't have a, a, the, enough education. I did not have the network at the time. And so what I asked was once I decided to go to the U.S. to, to do the investing is, help me understand, like, I know that I need to get a a mortgage because I didn't have enough money to pay for the entire property because I didn't want to buy like a $5,000 property or something like that. And so I was introduced to a number of bankers. I ended up finding one banker that worked at a retail bank. We had a great relationship. Um, She helped to introduce me to people. And that was where I knew I was going to be able to secure the funding, right? Because I had to take of consideration, even though I'm a U.S. citizen, I was living overseas, et cetera, et cetera. So started the first relationship with the banker. The banker then introduced me to someone who was a general contractor. The general contractor who knew the location introduced me to someone who was a broker. The broker introduced me, a, a, a real estate broker who introduced me to a real estate agent. So that's really how I started um, getting started. I had money. And then that was the quasi team that I put together just to help me make the first purchase. So again, I guess the lesson there is when it's, when you're ready to get started, everybody starts at different places. I mean, maybe people need to start with a no money down and you have a lot of extra time. I was working in a very busy corporate job. So what I did not have was time. I had capital. Sometimes you don't have, um, you don't have, uh, capital, but you have time. And so it's a matter of what do you use to, to be able to, to secure the outcome that you're looking for. So that was the way that I got started. Mm-hmm. I mean, there wasn't a lot more than that. The only kind of criteria Kerwin, that I put into place was if something goes wrong, do I have people that I can, that can get there to really bail me out? Like I was thinking if the house catches on fire or if something happens, can someone get there? And that was my selection criteria. So a couple things there. What I would say is the way that I got started is not the way that I teach people now to get started, right? Because you make Mm. your mistakes and I didn't have a network. And so you really want to think about where is, first and foremost, like what is the, I think the most important thing is what what is the benefit that you're looking for? Like, are you looking for uh, the ability to, to create more cash flow? Like I was at the time, are you someone who is earning more money and you're looking for some type of tax benefits? Do you just want experience? I mean, whatever the benefit is, then start there. After you were clear on the benefit, like this is kind of like the four step framework that I now talk about because you you asked me what are the things that I would learn is starting with your what personally what is it that you're looking for. Once you're clear on what that is, but and more importantly, why you're looking for that because times are going to get tough and when times get tough if you're not clenching on to your why you're just going to let everything go away, but everything starts there. Once you're clear on personally what it is that you want, why you want it, then the second step is really going to the location that's going to give you the best probability of achieving whatever that goal is, right? And whatever that location is, that's going to really dictate the next two steps is get to your location. And I'm sure I'm telling you things that you already know and that you (laughs) practice a lot already is start to build your team. Once you build your team, and whether that's from a, an insurance broker, or a real estate broker, a, an attorney, uh, a CPA in the area, what whoever the people are on your team, get the team built out because then after that, it doesn't matter if you're buying uh, a small multifamily building, if you are buying a, 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 a sm- sorry, small single family, a multifamily building, a piece of energy equipment, none of that matters because your team is already in place. They know the location and it's all tied into what it is that you're looking for and why you're doing it. I didn't, I did it just the opposite, right? Mm. And so that's why um, I share my experience initially where I got started and more importantly, doing it just the opposite in terms of 
now that you're listening, you're watching uh, Kerwin and I, that's the way that I, that I would start it and mm -hmm. give you things to to think about. Yeah, no, I I appreciate you sharing that. And you you mentioned cash flow was what you were seeking, but that's not what you found in Barcelona. And so I that's I would love to know. I mean, because you could have had a similar issue with the markets in in the U.S. Like certain markets here wouldn't work. So what were some of the criteria that you used? I mean, were you looking for cash flow heavy markets? And if so, what markets did you end up choosing? And were there any other factors that went into that decision? Yeah. So initially, no, Kerwin, it was like, literally it was, I had money in the bank and <laughs> I wanted to buy somewhere near my family. Like that yeah. was, okay. And, and I guess the reason that I share that is sometimes we try to look for perfection. Mm -hmm. And if we don't find perfection, we don't take action. And so the thing is, sometimes you don't need a master plan to get started. You just need a reason to take action. The thing that made me take action was I missed my son's third birthday and I didn't want to leave my whole financial life um, really at the whelms of the, the Wall Street casino. I didn't want to do that. I didn't have a clear plan, but I knew that I was going to buy in, a, in an area that was close to family. Yeah. I, bought in New, I bought in New Jersey at the time. Would I buy there again today? No, um, <laughs> but I got started there. And, mm -hmm. and through the trials and tribulations that I realized, that's why now I tell people what, you know, or, or share with people or teach people that figure out what it is that you want. And so if you're looking for a cash flow market, for instance, then you start to look up the locations that give you the highest probability of cash flow. Like later, many years later, once I had a lot of small family, smaller multifamily, I had a mobile home park in my, in my portfolio. Then I started realizing, hang on a second, I live in Spain, I've got a lot of money coming in, I can't keep up with these things, but now I need a structure, now I need a format. And that's when I went out, I got a paid mentor, and I started mm -hmm. learning, okay, what are the things that I should be doing? And that's when it came to the idea of, okay, get clear on what you're looking for. So because I'm looking for cash flow, then I went into this big study of different locations in the United States that were more predominantly cash flow markets. They didn't have the big fluctuations in terms of the overall value, but they were pretty much consistently known. And I looked out in the Southwest, I looked in the Southeast, I looked mm -hmm. in uh, in the Midwest where I'm from, right? And I remember going through this really big long spreadsheet and I looked at these different locations and I, I looked at a number of different criteria. Were there more people moving to this location than, than, than leaving the location? How many different companies were there? Were they Fortune 500 companies? Were they very largely diverse? I mean, at the time when I was looking, was it automotive industry, financial services industry, government? And the more diversification of jobs in those locations, then that was a good thing for me. Because I had, the, at that point in time, I was thinking a lot about what happened in the automotive industry, and I didn't want it to be a, a kind of a one trick city. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I looked at sports teams, and I, liked, I looked at a lot of different criteria to then decide on four different locations that I was looking at. And then from there, I, I delved down even deeper. I started meeting the teams in those locations. And then I got to a point that I knew that I wanted to go to one specific location. And I focused at that point in time, after looking at a bunch of, I think it was like literally 11 different markets, got to four four markets, then I went into sub markets. And I ended up at that time, I was moving into uh, the Charlotte, North Carolina MSA. And then mm -hmm. from there, it was about looking for different opportunities to purchase but the thought process was very different later versus when i got started yeah. so hopefully that makes things uh makes things absolutely clear. no it absolutely does and i mean there's a lot there i really want to dig into i, I think i'm one of my favorite parts of interviewing people um on the show is when to kind of analyze where they started and where they are now because a lot of people might not be able to relate to where you are now but i think most of us start in a similar area if not you know, of course we all start the race at different spots but it's so inspirational to hear where you're coming from and um you mentioned that you didn't really have all the education you needed but that's okay because it's about taking action i think we are big advocates for learning on the go and failing forward um and so i really love that now i do know you mentioned that you eventually do get into passive investing and multifamily. that's obviously you know part of the journey that you've taken, I would love to know, how did you come about breaking into the multifamily space and uh, also passive investing? And how did you come about learning about that? Yeah, sure. So it's kind of a funny story, Kerwin. And, and once again, I mean, this is all founded in, I come from a very, um, like I said, humble, humble family, very blue collar and watch my parents work really, really hard. And so as they made all these sacrifices to put us in really good school districts and we get the college degrees and we start doing this. And then I start getting into rooms with people, you know, we're very high achievers in the corporate world. And I was working in software sales and enterprise software sales, application software sales. So it's a, a very unique, very people that are typically highly paid. And 
I was trying to do things like an A student, right? I was purchasing these properties and I was taking, I was working my day job. I was working all day, all night, right? It, but I knew that I was working towards something. And as I started to build up my portfolio with these smaller multifamilies and then I bought the mobile home park and things were happening, I then heard about something called passive investing, right? And what I didn't even understand, and, and I know you all talk about this, but I didn't understand that as someone who is, is known as an accredited investor, which means you, you meet a certain income criteria or a certain uh, net worth criteria, or nowadays there's even um, educational criteria. I've, I found that I was in this particular group of people. So I had access to very unique type of investment opportunities. And so then I started realizing that I didn't have to trade more of my time to manage the property. So then I started finding and meeting other people like you and your brothers and uh, that were that were bringing people together to purchase larger pieces of, uh, of larger assets that you wouldn't be able to purchase on your own. And so as I started to meet people like you and your brothers and I'd learn more about them and what are you doing and they would tell me how this particular type of opportunity would be able to benefit me and get me closer to my life goals, I started investing in other things like um, like ATM machines and mm -hmm. other larger multifamily, um, you know, I've invested in a couple of larger multifamily 200 plus unit uh, type of opportunities. I've also invested in development opportunities. And I had a very unique kind of problem. And this is where passive investing also helped me was I was someone who was a high wage earner. And although I love real estate and still love real estate at the time, I was not someone who was known as a real estate professional. So I was paying a lot in I was buying a lot of real estate and investing with other people in real estate. And I was still paying like 40 plus percent in taxes because I have my W-2 income. And so then I started looking for a way to solve that W-2 income problem. And even through passive investing, found a way to do that um, through pieces of equipment mm -hmm. in the energy sector. And then even started to help other people who are high wage earners do the exact same thing. So I didn't know about it in the beginning. And a lot of times, it, it, I mean, you, you incur when I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, unless you have access to certain types of information or certain types of circles, you don't know. I mean, I speak to people all the time today that are accredited investors that meet those criteria that I was mentioning to you before. Mm -hmm. And they didn't, they don't even know that they're accredited investors, that they have access to passive investments where they don't have to trade their time for money. They do need to trade their time to meet and sit down with people like you and your brothers to understand more about what what you're doing, how you can potentially help them. And then from there, they can make the investments passively that are gonna help them get to their goals and to their dreams, which is exactly what I'm doing today. So yeah, hopefully that also hopefully that also answers the question. No, it absolutely did. It absolutely did. And earlier you mentioned how you really like having control. And I think there's a lot of people that can relate to that investing in real estate. And I, I think it's fascinating because as a passive investor, you don't have any control, but as an active investor, I mean, you pretty much have all the control. So I'd love to know what is it, some advice you have for somebody who also can relate to that, that wants control, but let's say, I guess my question is twofold. First, would you recommend that they be an active investor or if you maybe, if, if passive investing is like more appropriate for them, what are some factors as a passive investor that they can control? Yeah, I think that there's the, the most important thing is, and this is so also too, when, and I'm thinking about when I first got started and you don't necessarily, I guess everybody understands themselves. Like if you're someone who is really literally high control that you mm -hmm. need to control everything, then if you know that about yourself, maybe any type of investing is going to be difficult, for you, <laughs> right? Because, yeah. because you just like so much control, any investment doesn't work. But if you're somebody who says, Hey, listen, I've only been doing this because it was easy i.e. I've been investing my DCA, my dollar cost averaging, because that's what everybody says and that's what everybody else around me is doing. But in your stomach, you're kind of thinking, you know what, I don't like the swings of the Wall Street casino that things are going up, things are going down. I literally have no control. My money is across 18 different companies or 80 different companies. When I ask my financial advisor, they're not even able to tell me. They just tell me, don't worry, just hang on, just hold on. Well, there you know that you absolutely have pretty much zero control, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's one thing. The other thing is, are you willing to invest the time to sit down with Kerwin to understand the business plan to fly to whatever city if that's what you need to do? Because it's typically going to be one or two different projects that you're looking at. And when you make that investment of your time, are you meeting the people that are actually going to be managing the asset? Do they inspire you? Do they instill confidence in you that they know what they're doing so that when 
you make the wire transfer that you don't have that you don't have like um, an out of body experience thinking, oh, my gosh, I don't even know what's happening. So I think although you don't have the ultimate control as someone who is investing with others and the technically that term is the limited partner, yeah. you do have a very different way of actually going through due diligence because you can sit down with Kerwin. You can, I, I can look you in the eye and I, you can tell me, or we can get on a Zoom. Or um, if, if you wanna introduce me to somebody who's actually gonna be managing the asset on a day-to-day -day basis, I can meet that person. I can speak to that person. It has, like for me, it's a completely different world than just doing the dollar cost averaging and sending your money to somebody who doesn't know your name. They're in an 800 number and it's across 80 different assets. So to me, there's control lack of control and absolutely no control. Mm -hmm. And there are things for me when you are investing as a as someone who is a limited partner in a in a real estate syndication that yes, you don't have ultimate control, but you can actually go out and meet the team. You can meet the jockey, sort of speak, as, as we like to talk about. And that then will allow you to understand, is this the right team that I want to invest more time and more capital with? So, mm -hmm. so hopefully that gives a different perspective in terms of control and some of the things that you may want to think about. Uh, but ultimately, if you're somebody who absolutely needs to control everything, well, maybe in investing with others probably is not the right thing <laughs> for you anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. A great insight. I appreciate that. And you've emphasized the importance of the team and uh, what always been something that we've been just continue to hear and we understand the importance of, of the role the team will play. They're the biggest risk factor when it comes to the success of a multifamily or real estate property in general. So I'd love to know how are you, and you've, you've coined them as a world-class teams is the teams that you work with. I would love to know, how are you finding these world-class teams and, and maybe just give some insight into how you're vetting them? Sure. And a lot of this is, so a lot of this is um, related to just things that I've done for 26 years when I was in the corporate world, right? There, and, and also having worked and traveled to 86 countries, you start to learn how to meet people, understand not just the individual, but the things that they're saying, the things that they're not saying. And when you, when you meet anyone that's world-class, it has to start with an introduction. So whether that person has allowed, that person or that company has allowed you to meet them or you've been introduced to them from a referral, which is one of the best ways to do that. It's about being able to not only understand or see if they if their value system aligns with yours. And I don't mean what you see on the website, right? Because what you see <laughs> on the website is a lot of marketing. But anytime you're going to invest in a relationship, especially a long term relationship, it's really important to get a couple things right. It's like any relation. I mean, I've, I've got a brother and sister uh, married. I've got lots of friends that I've had for many, many years. And it's about being able to communicate clearly. First of all, okay, well, what are you interested in doing? How do you go about doing this as a company, right? Just to, from a values perspective, a mission perspective. And then afterwards, being able to, if you've started with a phone call and you've gone to Zoom, eventually, I believe that you, you can't just talk the talk, you have to walk the walk. Meaning you meet people, you understand what they're doing, you start to ask some of the questions that make you feel uncomfortable, i.e., what do you do when to someone passes away on a property or what do you do when you run into issues with cash flow or cash management or how have, you know you want to understand what types of experiences the challenges that they've been through if someone if you're going to create a relationship with someone that's never been through any challenges Kerwin, i'm going to recommend that you probably run the other way <laughs> because it's highly unlikely that someone who's world class has not been through any type of a challenge and so that person needs to tell you, that person, that organization, they need to tell you about what those challenges were, what they did to recognize the challenges, and most importantly, what did they do to, to make it right or make it as close to right as possible. Listening to that, always understanding if it aligns with you, your value system, and the mission that your, your company is on. You may ask people also too, hey, listen, depending on what the investment of your time and your capital is going to be, you want to be able to look and understand what are they doing with their books and these types of things. And if the relationship is valuable enough, there should be no problem in that. Right. And it, and it can't be just online eventually. Like I said, if the if the relationship is important enough and you guys know this, you because you're out all the time meeting people um, and you, you go out and you meet with people face to face, you fly to their offices, you see what their organizations look like. It's just part of a normal relationship building um, a normal yeah. relationship building process, uh, I think is, is the way that I would yeah. explain it. Absolutely. I mean, I think people forget that we're all just humans and it's, you know, just getting to know someone and learning to build trust with them. Um, that's so important. So I appreciate mm -hmm. you sharing that. And now it is time for our speed round. Are, are you ready? 
I'm ready, man. Let's go. <laughs> awesome. All right. It's just easy five questions, but um, take as long as you want. But, you know, we're going to go ahead and just back to back. So let's get started. Right. So yep. the first one, what has been the biggest failure that you've encountered or learning lesson that you've encountered along your real estate journey? And what did you take away from that experience? So from a real estate perspective, the biggest fail, I mean, you could talk about the money losses and things like that. But one of the things that when you're a recovering perfectionist, you try to do everything on your own. And what I've realized is the things that I was trying to do on my own, which was completely the opposite of the why I excelled in the corporate world, it stifled the growth. I mean, we didn't grow as as quickly and were able to get to the to the uh, people that we want to serve. So trying to do too much myself in the beginning, uh, because I was working a day job, I wanted to try and control things rather than making sure that I was looking for the right who's rather than how to actually get every single thing done. That was that was one of the things that I would say is a was something that I wasn't aware of because I was just in the weeds. Once I became really aware of it, then I was able to put the corrective actions in, in place mm-hmm. to continue to now um, help and, and serve the, 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 the people that we are, that my company's built to serve. That's awesome. And, and looking forward, what are you aiming to accomplish in the, in the long term? And what's the goal for your business uh, in the future? Yeah, we want to make a positive contribution to the world. The goal is really to get out and help more uh, accredited investors, as I mentioned to you before, mm-hmm. um, specifically uh, what we'd like to be, what we're, what we're aiming to do and what we're working in and building the business to do is specifically uh, to, to be able to go out to serve 200 accredited investors, be able to help bring them the value that they're looking for and be able to do that in a way which is also creating community, creating family. It's awesome. And a lot of it, sorry, and a lot of that, Kerwin, is really around financial intelligence. Uh, and I know sometimes it's, it's said over and over, but I, I'm surprised the number of doctors, lawyers, uh, high paid professionals that I speak to that, number one, they don't even know what accredited investors are. And then number two, they don't really understand the different characterization of, of money. And I didn't know that for a really, really long time. And if you don't know how money is characterized by the IRS uh, or wherever you live, uh, it's really difficult for you to understand which vehicles are going to get you to the destination of your life mm-hmm. as efficiently as possible. So I'm really, really passionate about that right now. I love that. And I think this next question will tie into that. And you also mentioned the importance of knowing this, but what is your why? Well, for right now, my why is to continue to spread uh, financial education to specifically right now, the accredited investors also for me, the real why, like the way I, the reason I wake up every morning is because I have two young children and I want to set the example for them. I work on being the best version of myself every single day because when you have a 10 and a 12 year old, they're looking to me every single day for direction. And my goal is to be the best father and the best, uh, and the best husband uh, that I can be. But I'm passionate about helping people mm-hmm. to gain financial education. Yeah, I love that. Uh, you shared a ton of awesome knowledge today. I really appreciate it. If anyone in our, so, sorry, if there was one piece of advice that you would want someone in our audience to walk away with or one piece of wisdom, what would that be? Don't overthink things, right? I, I heard this great thing by, by General Colin Powell and it was the 4070 principle. And he said, look, if you, he never made any mi- really major decisions with less than 40% of the information and he didn't have more than 70% of the information. One of the things that can happen for people that are like me who are recovering perfectionist A students is we try to look for the optimal answer and we try to get everything done. It, you have to get to a point where you are comfortable with taking action on imperfect information and feeling okay with that, getting the feedback and being able to course correct. Uh, if there's one thing that I would say, it's take my example of me as a very young investor and just not trying to get every single green light red or sorry, uh, gr- green light before I left the house. It was just to have enough information to get started and then course correct from there. That's awesome. I appreciate that. If anyone in our audience wants to learn more about you or, or access to any of your resources, your podcast, or just follow you in, on your journey, where can they go to do that? Yeah, sure. I would tell everybody, first of all, go, like once again, go to the Going Long podta- podcast, episode 161. You and your brothers, it was awesome. You guys actually rocked it. Uh, for those people that are interested in understanding more, if you're an accredited investor, especially those people that are getting crushed by W-2 taxes, um, you can go to our website, which is firstgencp.com forward slash invest. And you can find out more about that and find out more about what we're doing. Obviously, the website is firstgencp.com. 
And also, uh, if you want, I love being on LinkedIn. I love connecting with people there. I think I'm the only Billy Keels in Barcelona, Spain. So it should be pretty easy to connect with me. Uh, and once again, like I said, if you're a W-2 earner who's getting crushed by, uh, by wages, feel free to go to firstgencp.com forward slash invest. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Billy. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks so much, Kerwin. Absolutely.